Hi everyone, today you're going to hear from an expert panel of four who are going to give you their tips, tricks and inside hacks on how to run remote design sprints. Remote design sprints are always a hot topic, but the big challenge is how to run them well. Today's small webinar gives you an inside track on the practical and valuable how to get them right. If you have any questions about how to run remote design sprints or you've got some resources and guides that others might find useful, just put it in the comments and we'll do our best to either answer your questions or share your tips and resources. Let's dive right in now and hear from our four fantastic experts, Wout, Anna, Tim and Robert, who've generously given up their time and some of their resources. Today's video is quite a long video, but it's designed to give you as much practical knowledge that you can use straight away in one spot. So let's dive right in and hear what the experts have to say. Welcome to today's webinar. Um, apologies for my croaky voice, but today's webinar is incredibly important and we felt at AJ and Smart that it was better to do it um, well than not at all because this webinar is about remote sprints. And we have a lot of our sprint community based in Asia Pacific right now who are grounded um, with travel bans and they're reaching out to us asking for help on how they can run remote sprints, what are they and how do they run them successfully. And I have great pleasure in being joined today by an expert panel on remote sprints who are going to share with us the inside tips and tricks on getting the most out of a remote sprint and when best to use them. So I'm gonna allow each of our panel members today to introduce themselves, and then we'll get stuck into the questions straight away to provide you some practical value really quickly. So I'll start with, right, with uh, Anna. If you could just introduce yourself, Anna, and let the viewers know where you're from. Uh, thank you, Sarah. First thing first, I would like to congratulate everyone here. I think this is a really great initiative. I'm really excited to be part of this panel, and I'm looking forward to learn from everyone and share some of my experiences. So I'm Anna. I do product design and strategy. And I guess that almost three years ago, I joined forces with my life and business partner, Raz, and we created Just Mad. Now, a lot of people don't know that our name is actually an acronym and stands for Just Make a Difference. So we're a bit mad, but we also are trying to make a difference in the world. So um, yeah, we are a product innovation consultancy and we work with a large variety of companies, no matter how small or how big. We help them innovate better and faster. And most of our work uh, is delivered through um, workshops and we found out to be very efficient and uh, effective. 90% of our clients are remote. We were remote from day one. So I guess I'm really excited to share some of the insights that I have about design sprints and how to make them work remotely. Fantastic. And if I could introduce uh, Robert now. Hello, everybody. My name is Robert Scrobe. I am the person behind the Global Virtual Design Sprint. Uh, I'm basically versed in specialized in virtual design sprints or virtual work. Uh, my background is wide and varied. I was a former DJ. I owned companies. I worked in agencies. But primarily, my focus these days are getting distributed teams to think about their work in a virtual space rather than remote. And there is a, we'll get into that in a bit. Um, but yeah, that's primarily what I do. Uh, beyond that, I'm pretty active in the overall design sprint community. Um, I do a lot of professional development and consulting in the space. Um, and beyond that, I have, I have a little dog here that's trying to sleep. So I'm hopefully I'm not going to speak too loud, but that's, that's essentially what I'm all about. Thanks, Robert. Uh, and Tim, can we hear from you from the AJ and Smart team? Hey everyone. My name is Tim Hoofer. I'm uh, part of the uh, AJ and Smart consulting team. I have been uh, running design sprints since, uh, 2017. Um, and, um, yeah, since then we've also experimented with remote sprints, but most of our sprints are happening in person. So I think it's really, um, really interesting to have all your different perspectives on running remote sprints as well. Um, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to, um, yeah, spend time with you and talk about remote sprints. Fantastic. So, and lastly, Wout, welcome Wout. Perhaps you could give us a little background about you. Yes, thank you very much, Sarah. My name is uh, Wout Hermans. I'm uh, working for Mural, uh, based out of Amsterdam. Uh, what you see behind me is my, uh, my living room here in Amsterdam. Um, my team at Mural is largely remote, so uh, I'm, the, I'm the only one in Amsterdam. Most of my colleagues are on the other side of the, other side of the world. 
Um, as you might know, Mural is a, is a visual collaboration tool, but we try to be more than a tool because a tool is just a tool, right? Uh, you need to have like the way, like on how to work with that. So what well, we're also really big on like services and consulting and helping people, um, yeah, do visual collaboration, do remote visual collaboration. So I'm, uh, super excited to be part of this panel and, uh, share some of our experience, but also definitely to, uh, to learn from the others. That's great. Thanks. Well, so I think we'll get stuck right in and try and maximize as much of this hour as possible, focusing on the solutions for viewers. Um, I'm going to start by asking Robert, what is the difference between a remote sprint and an in-person sprint? Because they're very different animals. And I think it'd be useful just to set the scene up front about obviously people aren't in the room, but what are the other challenges uh, that sit around a remote sprint versus an in-person sprint? How are they different in terms of the leaders? I'll kind of expand that question also to include virtual because there are three distinct uh, modes of doing design sprints. The in-person one is one we're all familiar with where everyone kind of gathers in the same physical space. Uh, kind of works through different activities related to design sprints. Maybe it's a four or five day. Um, it could be a modification of it, but essentially you're all in the same place. Remote is the idea that you're doing a design sprint with a distributed team of people. Now, they can be a group of people in one location, whereas you have one or two satellite connectors in other countries in different time zones, and you have to kind of work out the logistics of that. But that's typically what involves a remote design sprint. A virtual design sprint is unique in the sense that everyone is on their own screen. That's by default what everyone comes to as a platform so that everyone is on the same page and on the same kind of uh, mode. Uh, the challenges inherent with all three of them primarily depend on context and personnel and also connectivity, more so for the, the virtual and remote aspects. Connectivity and functionality and uh, digital gap, digital understanding of the tools are huge. Uh, in person, it's more or less the dynamics in the room and the power dynamics that go into some of the, uh, the key stakeholders that may or may not be present. Overall though, where I usually center is for virtual because the inherent advantages are that you can re record pretty much everything. Uh, you can leverage tools like Mural to facilitate a lot of the kind of ideation aspects of the process as well as sharing. Um, I've used Mural exclusively now for I guess about a year and a half, two years, and uh, it's it's been really successful for us. For remote sprints, they, that's usually the bridge for companies that are used to doing them in person where you don't necessarily go completely into the remote world of doing design sprints there, but you kind of cascade or, or transition into. The biggest challenge there is the communication really and, and keeping people's attention when you're doing a design sprint in that, in that aspect. Uh, so I, I think that would be a, a really high level overview of all three uh, all three choices that you could have for design sprints these days. Fantastic, that's great, Robert, that's a good introduction. So it's interesting to see that there's three actual perspectives and I think, Tim, you might agree, we, uh, we tend to run a combination when we are required to run remote aspects. It's more of a remote than a full virtual. Um, I, I would say it's a mix of, uh, yeah, it's a mix of virtual and, and remote. I mean, it's really interesting to hear this distinction because I've actually never really thought about that distinction in that way, but I think Robert is, is I mean, that is exactly right. So these, uh, these kind of like three different modes of running a sprint. Um, I mean, like for us, uh, uh, calling it remote sprint basically means doing a virtual sprint with people, you know, like sitting in front of their laptop but it's true. I mean, for a lot of corporates that are, you know, like globally distributed, it's going to be something that is kind of like a mix of in-person uh, with, you know, like video conferen conferencing with another team. This is something that we usually don't, don't do. So it's either in-person or virtual slash remote, um, depending on the kind of workshop we're running. I mean, we're also doing like these iteration workshops that are, you know, like a little bit lighter on, um, you know, like the demands on the facilitator as well. So I think in these cases, sometimes it's also um, it's also possible to do a lot of the work remotely without relying too much on a virtual tool. Um, but it's it's true. I mean, the uh, the amount of of preparation that would usually go into 
into a sprint. It just changes dramatically once you introduce a virtual tool and you have to make sure that um, everything works perfectly for every person, especially when you're not working with, um, you know, like a tech startup or a young company that is used to, you know, like basically using every tool at their disposal when you're working with more established industrial companies, very often you have issues that like for one, they cannot access the tools or they don't have a webcam, they don't have a microphone on their computer. So all of these issues um, are um, things that we encountered ourselves and we, we pretty much learned by, uh, you know, like trying as many things as possible and also running into these problems so that we could improve on it the next time. Um, yeah, but it's 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 really interesting um, to hear this distinction of you know like in person, remote, and virtual because I think it makes it makes a lot of sense. We're going to adopt it now, Tim. Yeah, yeah, that's the benchmark. Thanks, Robert. And Anna, well, do you have anything to add to that in terms of differentiating between remote versus virtual? Anna, maybe I could hear from you. I guess, thank you, Robert, for that perspective. I guess that, as Tim mentioned, it's really interesting for us to hear a fresh perspective. For us as an agency, we always looked at them as remote sprints. I guess that design sprints are hard enough in person and even more so remote with distributed teams. And to me, the key of successfully run a design sprint remotely is actually a combination of three elements. It's preparation, tools, and facilitation. But I guess that the first one plays a much bigger role. In my opinion, I guess that 80% of the success of a remote design sprint is dictated by preparation, and I'll explain why. So my first ever remote facilitation experience was kind of a disaster because uh, I worked with this client from New York. He was pretty open to the process. But I tried to replicate uh, the in-person version with an online version. So it was obviously a bad idea. I guess that there are so many differences that you have to take into account. But after running dozens of remote sprints, we came up with our own recipe or how to do it by our book. Uh, the main challenges that we have faced over time is that obviously time zone differences and availability, low engagement. Um, so you have to make, them, make it more interesting for them because you're not going to be in the same room with them. You're not going to feel the energy. And then obviously, uh, even if we are in 2020, we still have tech related issues. Uh, almost every call starts with, can you hear me? Can you see me? Is this working? Yeah, this still happens. So this is an evergreen problem. You have to consider that. And then there's also the problem of ineffective collaboration due to poor communication. Um, I can tell you that preparation is crucial and I cannot stress enough. The best way to ruin a sprint even before starting it is neglecting the stage, uh, especially when it's online. Um, I know that the sprint is meant to accelerate ideation, prototyping, and testing. And while some might consider that pre-sprint work is counterintuitive or unnecessary, uh, but based on our experience, doing prep work is crucial. Uh, for us, it's just impossible just to start, let's say, if we have a conversation with a client today, it's quite challenging for us to start a sprint on Monday because we usually take two weeks of prep work just to understand the challenge and make sure that, yeah, we understand the challenge, we understand the team and their processes plus dynamics and sometimes even politics. Uh, we have to understand their expectations. So before running a sprint, we always have one or two weeks to do proper problem framing. So uh, once we know that we have a design sprint uh, that is going to happen, uh, we get familiar with the challenge at hand. So we talk to key stakeholders and we find who is responsible for what. And then we try to understand what impact they have on the problem. Uh, for problem framing, we use an interesting formula. It's called a bump formula. So we look at the challenge for, uh, from four perspectives. So it's business, user, market, and product. We try to gather as much information as we can around those. And once we have enough research around the challenge, we're putting together a sprint brief. Uh, we send it out to everyone. And I guess that sending a sprint to everyone will help them to get aligned, uh, all participants to get aligned and uh, understand what to expect from the upcoming sprint. Uh, we usually include uh, the challenge outline, schedule, time frame, as well as a checklist, things to do. Uh, I guess that gives them a better understanding what to expect. 
we are very picky when it comes to assembling the team because we want to make sure that we have the right people. We had cases in which we had to um, have a conversation with 12 or 15 stakeholders because they all had something interesting to say or to add. But we always stick to five or seven people to bring them in because even though it's remote or uh, virtual, we try to um, limit the number of participants, you know, just to have control over what happens. Um, scheduling, again, plays a super crucial role here. You don't want to schedule calls at 5 a.m. in the morning or 11 o'clock. Uh, in the evening. Um, I guess that we had this uh, example with this client from Australia. That, in that case, we had to make, um, let's say, we had to make it work for them and we had to wake up a bit early, but um, you, you want to make sure that you're accommodating everyone and you're not being too harsh with the hour. Um, we try to fit participants in a nine hour window. It's also important to let people know when you'll deem them and for how long, because we have a combination of synchronous and asynchronous meetings. Um, and we always, always make sure that we have preparatory calls with everyone. And we have actually individual mini trainings with all participants because we have learned that there's a certain learning curve for the tool that we're using in our case is um, Mural. And we neglected this uh, in our early um, early design sprints, and we realized that there are some people that do not know how to use it, and they're not very familiar. So you have to extract yourself from the bubble that you live in and understand that not everyone is a designer, not everyone works with product, and you have to accommodate those and make sure that they understand what they have to do and how to do it. Very comprehensive. Thanks, Anna. Um, one of the things that's just come up recently and quite topically for us on our LinkedIn channel is um, preparedness in terms of understanding cultural and organisational norms, in particularly the role of the decider. In your preparedness, Anna, how much do you take into account and prepare for in either your mini trainings or your onboarding? the cultural and organizational values when it comes to remote sprints? I think culture plays an important role in every single organization and in a company that everyone is aligned, uh, goals are very clear, initiatives are welcomed from everyone. <laughs> Pro uh, there's, there's a streamlined process. Um, obviously things uh, tend to go smooth, uh, but I guess an another important aspect here is psychological safety. I know this is a fancy words that a lot of team use more and more often, but it's actually true. If you have a culture around experimentation, if you feel safe to fail, well, at least up to a certain extent, I guess that having this culture towards experimentation, this is an environment that will embrace a process like the sprint and even more so running it, uh, running it in a remote environment. If there's no culture, around that and the company is still young uh, in exploring and understanding the benefits of the process um, and the benefits of remote work, I guess, in general, uh, there's a huge opportunity for us to educate these companies and showcase the benefits because I, I strongly believe that nowadays there are a lot of teams that focus more on the outputs rather than the outcomes. We often see this culture of getting things done, but not necessarily the right things. I strongly believe it's our um, it's in our hands and it's our responsibility to shed some light and explain um, the benefits and help uh, them level up. Um, Tim, I could hear from you or Robert around your preparedness. How do you, actually Robert, how do you help uh, prepare well and get that very first element right for remote sprints? What advice have you got for viewers in terms of specific inside tricks for preparing well for a remote sprint? The two things I always recommend to the clients I consult are, are beyond kind of giving a, a canvas of everything they need to know is figuring out who needs to, to who you need to speak to in a one-on-one -on -one capacity. Sometimes people won't voice their uh, discomfort or their, their objections to you know, working remote or remote sprints or the, the design sprint process, but they will speak to other people that they know. Um, chances are a lot comes out in those conversations that will enlighten you to a lot of what Anna's talking about, what their hesitations are. Are they unfamiliar with the tech? Are they unfamiliar with the process? Do they have concerns in relation to something that's happening 
in parallel to what you're doing? Uh, are they concerned about outcomes? If you get a hold of those conversations early, they don't manifest into issues that suddenly appear within your sprint or within your design sprint. I'm not saying you have to do one-on-ones with 30 to 50 people because that's a little unrealistic, but what you can do is do small groups, especially if they're uh, siloed teams in an organization that are being called into the sprint. It really helps to get perspective and then they feel like you have uh, not only ownership of their issues, but you can actually empower them and the situation to improve upon itself. Uh, That would be the first one. The other is to utilize video. In this day and age, you have the ability to reach out and communicate directly with a lot of your audiences, and that includes clients. There's nothing to say that you couldn't use something like Loom on your browser uh, and fire up Mural and walk through exactly what you're looking to have them do within a process or to explain how to use a tool. Sometimes the I see people send over links that are coming from like say uh, you know zoom or mural or any other tool that that the the team would use to understand how to use it but chances are no one has time to look at those however if it's coming from you and it's curated and personalized to understand it there may be an outside chance they'll look at it but they may have no time and just come to your sprint wanting to just work and is expecting you to explain it as is but those are the two i recommend First is to, if you have the, the, the kind of like the runway to do so, make sure you take time to meet individual stakeholders or individual team members in either one-on-ones or in small groups and uh, kind of figure out what they're most concerned about and what they're after. And uh, the second is to start recording what you know and putting that into uh, some sort of consumable form, whether it's on mobile primarily, or if you want to do it on desktop, that's fine too. But have a repository for Q&A and and use those videos so that people can consume them on their own time. In my experience with the Global Virtual Design Sprint and elsewhere, that's really made a huge difference for people, especially if they've never worked with something like Mural, to come on board and figure out what they're going to do when they're in session. Tim, do you have anything to add there in terms of preparedness? Yeah, right. I mean, um, one, so I would, I would agree with everything that was just said. I mean, the, the one thing um, I think that's key uh, in every design sprint is expectation management. And this becomes so much more important when you don't actually have the people in the same room. So this is actually adding a lot of like extra stress for the facilitator. I think um, everybody who wants to run a remote design sprint um, should, should be really aware of that. Um, so uh, in, in my view, there are actually two learning curves. So for the participant, it's being exposed to a completely new process. And even though the facilitator guides them through it, it's still, even in an in-person workshop, it still often feels very strange and, um, and weird. And, uh, you know, like the, the, the facilitator is really there to guide people through it and build this level of trust. And since you, you're kind of like lacking this um, interpersonal dynamic in a remote or virtual setting, um, you have this additional learning curve of having a tool kind of like in between the different participants. And I think this is why we um, also started doing um, preparatory uh, uh, one-on-one calls with um, every sprint participant. So we are, we are doing this for like the normal in-person sprints, but with a remote or virtual sprint, there is this added uh, component of actually setting up the tech with these people. And this is usually when we are already um, identifying uh, problems that might come up in the workshop. For example, um, when you're working with a client from from China, for example, um, like will their internet connection work? I mean, usually, like very often these people are using a VPN or maybe some websites that are very commonly used for, for Western or uh, American clients uh, just cannot be accessed. So in that case, you, you just need to find, find out like what can we use instead. And I think having extra time to test that and just make sure that everything runs smooth will really help you have a successful workshop. Because I mean, the, the, facil- the facilitation part is hard enough. Um, and it gets even more difficult when you actually have to stop the workshop at times to fix some some people's issue with the tech. Um, one thing that I would also um, um, recommend, if it's possible, to have an extra person um, that is not facilitating but that can help in the background. And and this is 
it's funny because that role exists in in-person workshops as well, and it's usually the person who's taking photos or running off to you know like bring bring water or snacks. But even in a, re in a remote or virtual setting, this person can really help. Um, even if there are like these little annoying things happening, you know, like with the person maybe moving a canvas in a tool or something, and um, as a, as a facilitator, you just don't want to deal with that stuff. And it's really nice having a person kind of like cleaning after the group um, as as we go along. So um, yeah, preparation is really really key. In any case, even more so for a virtual sprint. Great, thanks, Tim. Just before we move on to hear from Wout and, and delve more into some of the tools, um, I just have a question for Robert and Anna. Robert, you mentioned before that I think you, you used an illustration of um, it would be impractical to have a one-to-one -one call with up to 30 people. Does a remote sprint allow you, in your opinion, to have that larger group on a sprint? Or, or are you still limited by, um, by, by a smaller number as you would be an in-person? So the largest I've done to date has been 20 in one sprint virtually uh, and usually what happens is if there are uh, on the client side depending on time zones and depending on the complexity of what they're after sometimes there's two teams that are running concurrent sprints with each other and they use the same repository to trade information documents and kind of communicate in that fashion so in a way you're just setting up a rumble it's just a little more sophisticated uh, anything beyond that you probably have to streamline things. If you're talking about uh, one team, without it getting too messy, the upper limits on the virtual side tends to be about 12 to 13 people in one sprint. And uh, with that, like uh, Tim just said, there's plenty of room for co-facilitators, mentoring, of, of like some pre-work that can be done. People can kind of be, uh, have their roles clearly defined within that kind of, uh, kind of arrangement. So in my experience, that's what I've seen. Anna, just a question for you because you have the benefit, uh, like us, of running in-person and remote sprints. Do you feel like there is um, a facilitator persona that's better suited to virtual sprints versus in-person? Do you think that there's a certain personality type or approach um, that, that is better suited to the remote environment. I guess that there uh, are certain skills that a facilitator needs to have overall. So the first thing, make sure that you own the process and you understand the mechanics. You have to be an excellent communicator. You have to be very sharp when it comes to observing things. You need to have a strong intuition. But I guess that there are certain things that will just come with experience and the more sprints you facilitate, uh, the better you're be you'll become at it. Now, obviously there's a difference between on-site and remote sprints because when you're in the room, you can, with, uh, with those people, you can actually see the person and then you can see, you can feel the energy. Uh, you can see if they're on their phone, if they're bored, if they're paying attention or not. But when it comes to remote sprints, um, it's pretty hard to have visibility on what they do during a session. So. And here we actually check on and on with them to see uh, if they are on the right path, if they understood the challenge or the task that they have at hand. I guess the main idea is to keep uh, people focused and to make sure you communicate very clear. And one thing that we found to be really, really useful is to have a visual support. Every time we have an online session, we are heavily relying on our visual storytelling skills to make the best out of it. Uh, even if you have a simple task at hand, make it visual so that you don't leave too much space for interpretation. Uh, we found that- Thanks everybody. Well, I'm gonna hear from Walt now and we're gonna talk about tools because there's obviously um, a large spectrum of opportunity out there in terms of tools, of what we can use and what we can't. Obviously, the success of um, a remote sprint relies incredibly heavily on the tools, their ease of use, their availability, their universality. Um, so I'm going to hear from you now, Wout. Talk us through, um, obviously, from the perspective of Mural, um, how to get the tools right um, and what, what can viewers of today's webinar use really as a checklist for selecting a tool and also what to do when they're in, in session 
uh, with regard to tools. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, it's a very big topic, and we we've heard tools coming up uh, from uh, from the others already, like in in the preparation already, right? It's um, it, it, it's super essential, and we we view tools. Um, yeah, we have like maybe like kind of like a checklist, or maybe like five different categories of very important tools, the most essential tools. There is many more, like you know, there are thousands of tools, but there is like five different categories that we think are essential. Of which the first one is to communicate in real time. You need a, a video conferencing tool, right? Whether that's Zoom, Microsoft Teams, Skype for Business. This really depends on, uh, on on your preferences as a facilitator. You need to be comfortable with it. Very uh, very important. But also on the situation you're in with the client, as as Tim mentioned in the before, like customers might have like a very different environment than than you're used to. You also want to um, make your client comfortable with the tools they're they're used to already. Uh, communicating in real time is uh, is like that's where the action happens, right? That is like the, a very important one. But as you're doing things virtually, remotely, you're also often working uh, across different time zones. So communicating asynchronously is essential. You're not always uh, in, uh, in, in the real-time mode, having Zoom open uh, while preparing. So communicating asynchronously, whether that's like through Slack, text messages, WhatsApp, any, any chat that you use, e email maybe even, uh, what way, in one way you can stay in contact with each other. Um, is super uh, yeah super important here um, and again make that as comfortable as possible for you and for the um, for your uh, for your client then there is things that support that in like helping you um, helping you organize a sprint online like a third one there I would say is tools to stay organized whether that's like a, a calendar or whether that's like a project tracking Maybe something like uh, like Trello, Basecamp, these kind of tools that help you put a checklist together. Maybe you have like your sprint checklist in there that you share with uh, with the people that you're organizing it with, or even with your uh, with your client. Um, yeah, they are like very helpful uh, there. And then of course you have a you, you need to have a place where where most of your content lives to share your content. Think about drives, Google Drives, Box, Dropbox, all these types of uh, of tools. And finally, uh, and that is where, uh, where I think we come in as Mural, you need a, a place to think visually. And I say this like, hey, this is a place where we come in, right? It's not like um, one, you can do it on one tool. You really rely on this spectrum or this ecosystem of tools to work, uh, to work together. So Mural there is like a visual, a visual workspace. The way, uh, the way we, we try to uh, explain like the benefit of that, I, uh, I really like that way of explaining it is, Tools like Zoom, uh, we use to see each other, right? A lot of verbal communication going on. Tools like Mural, a visual collaboration tool, we use to understand each other. So really when you visualize things, things come to life and you, uh, you really understand, the, uh, understand each other here. And I, I mentioned it a couple of times, I'm gonna, I'm gonna repeat it again. You need to be, as a facilitator, you need to be comfortable with the tools you are using. You are the one that is guiding the people through the, uh, through the exercises. Um, if, if you're not on top, on top of it, if you're not the one that is uh, that is leading them and can explain explain things, um, yeah, you, things things might go wrong. I, I can see that. Like I've been in, in Robert's uh, in Robert's sprints or sessions with Robert. Like I'm I'm always amazed about like the things that he knows. I learned the latest tips and tricks on almost every tool uh, from him. He's really on top of on top of things, and that that make, brings a certain peace to your uh, to your sessions. But of course, I want, I want to highlight there, like you cannot just become Robert overnight. Like it's, it's impossible to become Robert, but maybe to become at the level of Robert, there's a lot of like steps that you take and it's really um, step by step that you will get more comfortable by it. But um, yeah, do your homework, but then try it out. And um, uh, yeah, learn, learn these, uh, these kind, of, uh, kind of things. Um, one other highlight that I wanted to do is like Robert already mentioned, um, turning on your webcam, seeing each other, verbal, this verbal communication is super important. But again, in, in different contexts, different uh, companies, different cultures, people might not, uh, might not be, um, be used to, uh, to doing it, right? So one, uh, one tip that I, that I can give there, one thing that I try out I, is 
to just say in the beginning of the sprint, just say, uh, or the beginning of the session, like, hey, let's just, at least for the beginning, turn on our webcams to, in order to see, uh, see each other and just see if they, uh, if they keep, it, uh, keep it turned on. And that, that often works for me, uh, those simple things. But also think about, I've heard excuses um, of not turning on your webcam because, uh, because it looks, I heard one yesterday, like, oh, I had a, I had a bad hair day, I don't wanna, don't wanna put it on. But also, like, you have a messy background, um, tip here, like use, use like virtual backgrounds like you have in, uh, in Zoom, like I'm, I'm in San Francisco now. It's, it's easy as that. Microsoft Teams has the blur feature that is, uh, that is great. Make use of, of, the, of these things, like technology can, uh, can, go, uh, can go a long way. That's fantastic. Wow, thank you. Um, I, I, I assume that if we become rubber overnight, that do we get the gray hair as well? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to ask Tim to comment on some of the tools um, that we use, partly because AJ and Smart are renowned for having codified our process and, and iterated it and evolved it over many years now, you know, almost to the minute um, in terms of the, the approaches we take to sprints and, and other workshops. Tim, your view on, on tools and what's going to work? What tips have you got for our viewers today? Yeah, um, yeah, that's right. I mean, we are we really like standardizing things because it's way easier to just um, you know like have new people um, you know get trained in these approaches and also like slowly introducing them and giving them responsibility. With with remote sprints and virtual sprints, it's a bit trickier because the the tools are playing such a big part of it that sometimes this kind of like codified standardized approach just doesn't work because we cannot force our clients to use the tools that we prefer just because I mean for one it would be a really bad experience for everyone I mean we we are there to help them we're not there to just pull pull off a show or something uh, for for our own ego's sake so we have to we have to conform to their needs and their environment as well so we have tried different um, different tools um, and in the end, it really depends on, first of all, the type of client you're working with. I mean, in one, in one case, like none of the visual collaboration tools were, were feasible for them. So we actually had to rely on Google Slides as kind of like, a, um, a kind of like our hack to, you know, like actually make the workshop happen remotely. And actually in that case, it worked, it worked fine. I mean, we, we had to conform, you know, like our own process uh, and approach to these things to their situation. And I think in, like in the end, um, you'll always have to do that as, as someone who wants to guide people and be, um, be a service uh, uh, for them. So um, it, would be really, it would be really great though, if there was like the one tool that could do it all. I mean, in practice though, and this is why the preparation is such a key, key part of our process. So it's like the sprint is the tip of the iceberg and a lot of the work happens kind of like below the surface. And ideally the client will never know that all that stuff happened, you know, like sessions where we are running through the tech setup again and again and again, and then check if that's working now. Um, things like, you know, like figuring out how we plan around uh, different time zones, how we plan around um, website and service and tool restrictions in certain countries. So all of these things are becoming really important. Um, when it when it comes to like a setup, I mean, one one thing that we found out, and this is coming coming back to um, what uh, Ro just said about like being able to see each other. Um, for for us, this interpersonal experience is such a critical part of the process, and how much trust people give you as a facilitator that we are really trying to set things up in a way that the facilitator will have um, two displays, one with a tool and another one with a video conferencing tool. And we, we are asking our clients to do the same if it's possible for them, just because it will be a better experience for them as well if they are actually able to see each other's faces. Um, there are also parts of the process when we, by design, tell people to, you know, like, we're done with the tools for now. We're just giving you homework uh, and basically you can finish it on your own time and we will check 
check in with you to see how you're progressing. Um, and in the end, we will reconvene in the tool, in the visual uh, uh, workspace and kind of like come together again to proceed with the process. Um, be because one thing that I really like about the design sprint is that um, it, at least in the in-person sprint, it forces people to stop relying on technology when they're coming up with ideas. Um, and, and technology, like as soon as people have a laptop in front of them, there will be people who are opening up OmniGraffel or, or some wireframing tool to make the perfect concept. And we really want to uh, avoid that temptation of people to become too precious about the ideas that they're creating. So. Um, we, we have these kind of, kind of like built-in breaks in the process, um, at least if it's feasible with, you know, like different time zones where we are um, guiding people through the sketching process up to a point. Um, and when the point is, so when the time has come to actually create a concept individually, we tell people, log off now, we will check in with you individually. Um, and in three to six hours, just send it to the facilitator, we will upload it to the workspace and then we will come back. So uh, this is a really, really nice way to, first of all, they don't have to worry about, you know, like uploading stuff themselves. Basically somebody from the team is taking care of that. And it also allows people to still use their hands and, and uh, stop relying on, you know, like tools and, and uh, you know, like this, this, this perfect approach to designing something or designing a concept. So I think this is um, um, also something to think about that just because you're in front of a computer, it doesn't force you to rely on uh, apps and programs um, for the entire process. You can still have like a bit, like a bit, a bit of a, a mix of how you approach these different exercises. That's great, Tim. Thanks very much. Um, you've started to, to introduce the next topic, which is facilitation. Uh, and I'm going to, to point to Anna and Robert now as well. Anna, what tips or tricks have you got for facilitation? And I'm particularly interested in perhaps how you build that early rapport that in the room you can do through body language and in the coffee breaks, you can build that rapport really quickly, really early on. Um, can I have your perspective for our viewers, please, on your facilitation tips? Yeah, I guess this is an excellent question. I guess that some of that report is built before the sprint starts because we want to make sure that we had at least one conversation with the person, with the uh, people joining uh, the remote design sprint. Uh, I guess that the big challenge that we have here is day one and day two. These are usually workshop days uh, with the full team, and we notice how the sessions are. Uh, we break them down into chunks because we cannot replicate exactly the sprint as it is in person. You cannot have people on call for eight hours straight. That's just not possible. It's going to be uh, really tiring for them. So for us, the secret is to break it down into smaller chunks uh, of um, maximum two hour sessions. So the first thing I'm going to be, you know, uh, probably covering the same topics that were mentioned before, but for us, it's mandatory to have a proper call environment. We actually say this out loud, and this is a mandatory thing for us to have. We do not accept calls from coffee shops, you know, with a machine grinding in your background or with music. That's just not the way to go. Um, we always ask people, if possible, to have like a silent background, especially if they're working in an open space. We kindly ask them to go in a meeting room, but we do that in an email, not when the call starts. So they know upfront where to be uh, when the call starts. Uh, so proper call environment, this is absolutely mandatory. Then video sharing, again, we mentioned that it's mandatory, not necessarily because we are afraid that they're going to switch tabs. Obviously, they can do that, but we want to make sure that they are not lost because so many times we were doing a sprint and we saw people, you know, getting closer to the screen, like completely lost. And you can actually identify that and then see, you know, uh, if that person is struggling with something and you can write down on Slack. Um, when we facilitate sprints, uh, uh, both me and Raz, um, one of us is facilitating and the other one is just making sure that everything runs smoothly. So I guess this gives us a bit of an advantage. 
Um, managing expectations from the get-go, this is absolutely mandatory. Again, uh, you have to explain very clearly which are the challenges, uh, what are the expected outcomes. And we do not rely for, uh, to people to remember every single thing that we tell them. So we have a visual support again and again. We actually have a mural template that we've put together after so many iterations. And we have individual work, uh, workspaces just to make sure that things do not get complicated or messy. People might move things around. We try to lock them and make sure that we can um, take care of that as much as possible. Um, staying organized and giving updates is crucial. And we, so we have uh, synchronous and asynchronous sessions with, uh, with our team members. And after each call, we try to make sure that we get feedback from them. So we do not wait until the whole sprint is done, you know, to receive feedback. We want to make sure that they are comfortable to start the next session. Um, sometimes we also give them homework. So for example, for uh, the concept uh, part of concept sketching exercise, we have to give them homework. So we have a break. Um, we always have to check in with them because we want to make sure that they actually understood, even though we paste, you know, examples and we give them clear instructions, we just want to make sure that they understand what a concept look like so they just don't send us some I don't know, crazy eights or crazy fours yeah we had some cases um, and then we try to minimize the interaction with the tool as much as possible for them so for example we collect that homework we upload it so they don't have to do basically the only, the only thing that they have to do is to do the homework and then be online for the next session um, uh, saying organizing giving updates again this is very very important um, and try to see if someone is lost and if you see that the energy is low try to bring it up there are a couple of exercises that you can do uh when you just start the sprint and just you know make them feel more comfortable and make them feel that this is something interesting and fun to do not just another meeting that they have in their calendar um, one more thing to add here, we noticed that when we facilitate sprints remotely, people tend to feel that this is not like a full workday and this is just another meeting in their calendar. So we want to make sure that they actually allocate the time that they need. Even if we have only one hour and a half calls, we want to make sure that they allocate the full day for that and they do not work on something else during that time. That's super important. Thank you. Robert, can we hear from you around with your seasoned um seasoned approach that you any tips and tricks around the facilitation in the moment in the room in the sprint tips and tips and uh inside running for our viewers on facilitation i'm gonna need to, I'm gonna need to kind of bring it here so okay my experience with facilitation um monday seems to be the most pivotal day out of the entire engagement so after going through, I don't know how many virtual in-person remote sprints, the one thing I've learned more than anything else is not only are you there to run the, pro the, the process that is, is established by everyone to kind of go through a virtual sprint, you're also there to help, so help with conflict resolution and something that Seth Godin calls norming the room or essentially leveling out any, uh, smoothing out any um, any like conflicts that may be going on or any issues or may any un understand lack of understanding around why people are there in the first place. Uh, I have to credit Lisa Lambert for this first one where I tend to use a, a heavy uh, dose of icebreakers in the very beginning of my sessions. Uh, this kind of gives me a clue as to who, who's engaged and who isn't or who needs a little bit of like warming up before they actually get into what they're going to be doing for the day. Um, also, I tend to let conversations go. There's a tendency to basically stick to a very rigid timeline when it comes to sprints to get certain things done, like to go through different gates of exercises, whether it's the four-step sketch or the sticky, uh, the sticky decision or other things that traditionally we've all done as facilitators. But what I've learned is that if you allow people to express their point of view, uh, let them clarify their understanding, not only the process, but why they're there and what we're doing as an activity. Not to a certain extent, you don't want to let it go too far. But if you're able to give a little bit of breathing room for everyone to have them verify their, that why they're there, their understanding, maybe you give an elevator pitch in the very beginning around why everyone is there, the purpose of why you're doing things. This greatly helps everything else that happens during the week because then at least you've, you've kind of done that norming of the room or norming of expectations so that you can move both quickly both online and offline through different activities that you're asking uh, the group to do. Uh, 
I think it's really important to make sure that we remember that we're all humans first, regardless of the technology we do use, and that everyone needs to be heard and understood. And if you bring that, uh, if you bring that as like a, um, a higher level need to a facilitation effort, whether it's in person or remote, uh, your chances of success will be probably higher than normal. Great advice. We, um, I can't agree with you more, really. And I think managing the psychology of a team um, in the early stages of the sprint are in the facilitation component probably as important as the preparation is for the overall sprint success. Um, we have a range of techniques that allow people to, to through the, we sort of almost call it like a purging or a release of whatever their ideas that they're bringing to the table or whatever they're dealing with in the context of the sprint um, is incredibly important to address that up front. And I don't think that's so specific to a sprint per se, that's um, universal across any group work and group activity is just managing the psychology of a team um, and getting people focused on the problem and clarity and alignment <clears throat> around the problem at hand. Before we head into our final um, topic, uh, Tim or Wout, did you want to add anything into that you think we've we've missed critically in terms of a facilitation tip or trick? Nothing, nothing critical. Uh, I would say I could give a small tip, but uh, maybe in the interest of time, we can. When when would you choose a remote sprint over an in person? And I think. Obviously, for the Asia and Asia Pacific community, there is no choice right now. Um, and this webinar and the resources we're going to make available in, in the bios and the notes, the show notes, is, is a gift to that community to help them deal with something they have to do. But there's also an environmental imperative. And I think we can, we can start to look at uh, using remote sprints more often um, in lieu of in-person sprints. Uh, wow, well, do you want to give us your view and maybe Robert um, particularly on when would you use a remote sprint over an in-person? Is there some criteria or litmus test viewers can use to help make that decision? And well, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's um, yeah very dependent on, on, on every situation and sometimes indeed people are forced by like, things that happen like the, like the coronavirus. But what, what we see happening with, with many of our customers is people are forced by sustainability, uh, sustainability reasons, whether that's like the concept of flight chain, uh, very big in, in, in Europe, particularly Sweden, like people don't want to, uh, don't want to fly anymore. It's looked at something as, as bad. I, you need to look for other, for other options. Other ways are uh, sust other sustainability reasons, like a company trying to be carbon neutral can have a big impact on all the, the workshops that are going on. Like, hey, we cannot, we cannot just fly around anymore uh, because of environmental reasons or travel bans because of cost reasons, right? Uh, Q4 in many enterprises is a no-fly uh, no time. Um, there is like necessities at those points to, to do remote, uh, remote sprints. And I think those, those, are, the, those are the clear ones uh, where you really just uh, have no other option. Like, that's it like you would like i think in general you would like to do things in person at least that's the way that's the way i look look at it i would love to like be able to work with uh, with my team face to face every day like we, we would have a lot of fun we would uh, understand each other immediately but like that's just not possible so i think reality whatever that reality is in your case it kind of decides that almost like what when it needs to be remote or in person thanks wow um i'm doing a lot of work my, remotely at the moment myself because i'm not wanting to infect the team with this uh, terrible cold but um robert finally from you um any any advice to viewers around why why they should choose a remote or when to choose a remote sprint um perhaps not so much from the, the environmental perspective, but maybe from a challenge perspective, you know, are there reasons when a remote is just better, even when you do have the, cho the choice of traveling and being in person? Yeah, I was going to say, I, I echo Wout's comments almost exactly. The, the situation that you may be forced to um, the, in the environment. Uh, I find that the clients I work with, the things that keep our coming up are speed. Uh, the costs involved with doing an in-person, which there are hidden costs, probably more so than virtual and remote, and flexibility are the, the key ones. 
So I'll go over those briefly. Speed is that uh, for the majority of the, of the clients that I work with, they don't care about the how or how it's done. They want to know how fast they can get to their objectives that the company is asking them to fulfill, whether that's pushing 15 different design uh, uh, projects out the door by the first quarter of this year or planning for 16 more for the second quarter, they want to speed up their internal processes, knowing that it's a slow cultural thing. Uh, they definitely are interested in utilizing their distributed teams so that their processes can be more versatile and more flexible for their situations. For costs, it's like what was saying before, a company isn't forced to fly everyone in from different parts of the world into one location to do an in-person remote sprint. You don't have to pay for their hotel. You don't have to pay for their, the costs that they have to accrue while they're there. The expenses have the administrative costs of having to process all of that. The follow-up where you have to eventually put everything digital because that's how everyone communicates these days. Uh, if you really track it, from, from soup to nuts, there is a substantial uh, business outcome argument around going more into the remote virtual space. Problem is, is that most companies aren't built for it and humans don't really like to change that much when it comes to things that are established, especially in enterprise environments. There's cultural norms, learning curves, uh, technical issues, or even like the, the uh, acquirement of tech sometimes has to go through a lot of uh, gates to basically make that happen. But those are the three, cost, speed, and flexibility outside of environmental uh, situations are the things that I'm hearing more and more these days. Thanks very much, Robert. So I think even if, um, even if people uh, have the choice of an in-person or remote sprint, perhaps the advice for, for, for viewers today is to really choose your customers, make sure they're ready for a remote solution so that you can make the best success uh, of the outcomes. I'm going to wrap up there today. Guys, thanks so much for contributing your time to, uh, to the viewers who I know will be very grateful for your expertise and your input. Um, check out the show notes because there'll be resources there in terms of insider guides, templates, um, and I know Wout and Anna have very generously provided um, some pretty comprehensive tools and uh, resources there. Thank you very much. Um, all the uh, experts on today's panel will watch the commentary uh, when we release the video on YouTube. So be sure to put any specific questions you have, or if you're looking for some signposts to particular information, uh, today's experts will keep monitoring the, the comment section. So you just stick your questions right in there. And we'll do our best to get you the, uh, the support you need and answer your quick questions when you need them. So thanks, everybody, from uh, AJ and Smart's perspective. Really appreciate your time and your energy and your dedication at doing something brilliantly, um, being in the, the virtual space of something we love, which is Design Sprints. You all have a good, great day, and uh, we'll speak soon. So thanks for watching. We appreciate it's a long video, but hopefully it was a valuable one for you and you got loads out of it to run remote design sprints well. If you want more practical, valuable information just like this, then subscribe on YouTube or follow us on LinkedIn, where every day we're releasing fantastic content just for you. Thanks so much for watching and see you again soon. If you want more content, sorry. If you want to hear more content just like this, and more of it, if you want to, if you want more content just like this, subscribe. If you want more information just like this, so, so <laughs> it's a really, it's a tough, so, subscribe. subscribe, especially with the croaky voice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Call one eight hundred.